just thinking with the, uh, the welcome to Karabi Christian Church up there, <clears throat> a church with a water view. All right, what I would like to talk to you about this morning is living with a biblical perspective. And I've based it in Ecclesiastes chapters 11 and 12. Now you can relax, it's not going to be a verse by verse exposition. It'll only be looking at the main principles. And I guess the question is how do you live your life? You know, we are all born with negative attitudes. You don't have to learn to be negative in thought. That's natural. It's a result of the sin nature. You're born with this negative attitude. You learn to be negative. Sorry, you learn to be positive. You learn that from your parents. You may have a little bit of it in your own DNA. And over time, you become a positive person. And we learn to be positive in our approach to life. Even then, we mightn't get to be as positive as we might like to be. You see, a worldview focuses on the accumulation of wealth and material possessions. And greed is not necessarily restricted to the wealthy. Coveting is not restricted to social class. How you view your life will make a world of difference in how you live your life. If you live your life viewing it from a biblical perspective, it will have a deeper meaning than if you see it through a pessimistic looking glass. In Ecclesiastes chapters 11 and 12, we find Solomon's ultimate conclusion to his view on life and the lessons that he had learned. So we look at a couple of key points in each of those chapters. Those are the key points that come up. Life is a stewardship, so invest in it wisely. And we see that in Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 to 6. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Well, we know that, don't we? And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know, what is in the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child? So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Now the term bread here is used symbolically for the grain from which it is made. To cast bread upon the waters, some people think that that refers to the practice of sowing in flooded areas. I'm not sure about that, although there are some things that grow in water, like rice and things like that. Or it may mean carrying the grain in trade by sea. In any case, the thought is that a widespread and wholesale distribution of what is good will result in a generous return in the time of the harvest. And this verse is true of the gospel. 
We may not see immediate results as we share the bread of life, but the eventual harvest is sure. Giving a servant, uh, serving to seven or to eight suggests two things, either diversification in business or, and I think this is the more important one, unrestrained generosity. If generosity is meant, the idea is that we should show uncalculating kindness while we can. Because a time of calamity and misfortune may come when that will not be possible. Most people say for a rainy day. Well, this verse counsels a spirit of unrestricted liberality because of the uncertainties in life. Another thought might be, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Since we don't know everything, we have to muddle along with what knowledge we do have. We don't understand the movement of the wind or how the bones are formed in the wound, but neither do we understand all that God does or why he does it. And since we don't know this, the best policy then is to fill the day with all kinds of productive work. And we have no way of knowing which activities will prosper. Maybe they all will. In spreading the word of God, success is guaranteed. But it is still true that some methods are more fruitful than others. So we should be untiring, versatile, perhaps ingenious, but above all faithful in Christian service. Then too we should sow in the morning of life, but not slack off in the evening. In other words, we're called to unremitting service. Everything in life, not only possessions, but family, friends, relationships, everything that you have is a gift from God. He entrusted you to the management of the bounties on his behalf. The things which he has given to you he has entrusted you with the management of that on his behalf. You don't own it. You only manage it for him. You see, all of life, so Solomon said, is a stewardship, and so we must invest in it wisely. Life is also a celebration, so delight in it. For us to enjoy life and see it as a celebration, there are three things which we must do. One is rejoice, that's verses 7 to 9 in chapter 11. Secondly, remove, that's verse 10 in chapter 11, and remember, and that's verses 1 to 8 in chapter 12. So if we look at rejoice, see what Solomon said. Truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they too will be many. All that is coming is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Rejoice in each day. Anticipate every new day as a rapt gift. 
from the hand of God and look forward to waking up and unwrapping that wonderful gift. Start your day with gratitude. Then verse 10 talks about removing. Remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Now remember we're talking here, Solomon, when he wrote Ecclesiastes, was an old man. And he's looking back across his life. And he's realised that a lot of the things that he's done have just been worthless. He did a lot of good. But he did a lot of things that were worthless. They were vanity. Just a puff of wind and they were gone. And he's reflecting across his life and he's giving advice to those who would listen to, as he calls himself in the opening verses, the preacher. Remove bitterness. Remove false beliefs. Bad habits. Unwholesome relationships. Get them out of your life because they endanger your future. And then when we get to verse, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, it says, Remember. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. It's a bit depressive, isn't it? Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Well, what's he talking about there? Well, this is what I think he's talking about. Other people might have a different interpretation of it, but I think he's talking about old age. Remember, he's an old man when he's writing this. Old age is the time when the lights grow dim, physically and emotionally. The days can be dreary, and the nights can be long. It's easy for gloom and depression to settle in. Even in earlier years, there was a certain amount of rain, uh, trouble and discouragement. But then the sun would emerge and the spirit would quickly bounce back. Now it seems like the sunny days are gone. And after each spell of rain, the clouds appear and promise yet more. Youth is the time to remember your Creator because then the sun, the moon and the stars aren't darkened, they're all bright. The clouds don't return after the rain. Now the body of the old man is presented under the figure of a house. Some of us will relate to this. The keeper of the house are the arms and the hands. They were once strong and active. For some they're now wrinkled, 
gnarled, perhaps trembling with something like Parkinson's disease. And I sometimes think now, I'm flat out carrying some of the shopping bags that June brings home. And for a number of years in my youth, before they started putting wheat straight from the harvester into trucks, they used to put it in bags. They weighed 190 pounds. And I would work from four in the morning till about one in the afternoon, and then from three in the afternoon till about seven or half past seven at night in the summer, throwing those bags up on my shoulder or onto the back of the truck or off the thing into, into the stacks. That was the easy part, getting them come up the escalator and drop on your shoulder and throw it on the stack. That was the easy one. The hard one was throwing them up on your shoulder and then up on the truck. And I'd do that all day for days on end. Now I'm flat out lifting up the shopping bags. I don't know how June does it. <laughs> you know, strength goes. Strong men, that's the legs and the thighs. No longer straight and athletic, but bowed like parenthesis marks as if buckling under the weight of the body. Had a long time playing in the front row in rugby. I had powerful legs. Now, if it wasn't for metal joints, I'd be in a wheelchair. The grinders cease because they are few. Mm. What are the grinders? That's your teeth. The teeth are no longer able to chew because there's too few uppers to meet the remaining lowers. A dentist might say there is inadequate occlusion. It just means you haven't got enough teeth. Those that look through the windows grow dim. The eyes have been failing steadily. First they needed bifocals, then trifocals, then surgery for cataracts, and now they can only read extra large type with the use of a magnifying glass. Well, I'm not quite there yet. I see Elizabeth waving to me. <laughs> I have been really blessed by the Lord with, with good eyesight for reading. I've only started using reading glasses in the last couple of years. But my distance vision is not good. I know that's Bronwyn sitting down the back there because I recognise the blouse that she's wearing. But I don't see her clearly. I've worn glasses to drive since I was 40 because my distance vision was not good. So people have different things. Some of you will have good distance vision but you've been wearing reading glasses for years and years and years. The eyes are not the eyes of youth. When you're young, you think you've got the eye of an eagle. But then as you get older, the lights dim. The eyes aren't as good as they used to be. The doors on the street are shut. Bless the ears. Everything has to be repeated over and over. Past June. you find that suddenly you're deaf in one ear and you can't hear out of the other. The hearing is, is gone. Loud noises to some people, to you, are low and indistinct. The old man suffers from insomnia. He rises up bright and early when the first bird begins to chirp or the rooster crows. By the time he's had breakfast, he's ready for sleep again particularly if I'm sitting in an armchair in front of the TV. All the daughters of music are brought low. The vocal cords are seriously impaired. The voice gets crackly and unsteady. Song is out of the question. Then some develop acrophobia. They're afraid of heights. 
whether it's ladders, views from tall buildings or plane rides. And terrors are in the way. That's simply saying that you've lost self-confidence. Some perhaps are afraid to go out alone. Some won't go out at night. The blossoming almond tree is generally taken to picture the white hair, first in rich profusion, then falling to the ground. Well, mine never went white. It just fell to the ground first. <laughs> the grasshopper can be interpreted in two ways. First, the gra grasshopper is a burden. Even the lightest objects are too heavy for the oldie to carry. Or the grasshopper dragging itself along, as it says in the New American, caricatures the old man bent over and twisted, inching forward in jerky, erratic movements. Desire fails, in the sense that natural appetites diminish or cease altogether. Food no longer has the same flavour. Other basic drives peter out. Sexual vigour is gone, all you're left with are memories. This degenerative process takes place because man is going to his long-lasting home. To Solomon that was death in the grave, and soon his funeral procession will be moving down the street. Well, fortunately, we're in a better position than that. Our body may go down to the grave or into the incinerator, but the spirit goes with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's a much, much better place to be. When none of these things are happening to you in your new body, when we get it, a perfect body, one that matches the body of Jesus. No more dimming of the eyes, no more creaky joints, no more getting up in the morning and as you straighten up from bed you sound like a coffee percolator. That's all over. That's all part of this world. It's not part of our future because we have a hope and a future in Christ. But Solomon's advice to the wise man is to remember the creator before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. Now, you, we probably can't uh, picture all of those meanings. Perhaps he's talking about uh, certainly, I think the silver cord is talking about uh, you know, the spirit of life, the spirit that God infuses into us to give us life. I think that's the silver cord. And perhaps the rest is talking about different levels in society, from the wealthy to the middle class to the poor. They all finish up in the same place. So the silver cord is the tender thread of life when the spirit is released from the body. Remember the constant presence of God. Wherever you go, he's with you and he is watching over you. Remember to obey his word and to seek his righteousness and his kingdom first. For that's the secret of any success that you have in life, is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember to place him first in every decision you make, whatever may be your age. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. How many times does that appear in Scripture? Never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Amen. He's with us always. We can learn a lot from the conclusions King Solomon came to in Ecclesiastes. But there's two more that we can look at from Ecclesiastes 12. Life is a school, grow in it. How does God teach us in the school of life? Primarily through his word. Our textbook is the Bible. Our teacher is the Holy Spirit. There are always new lessons in God's school. There are always new examinations or new tests, if you like, new tests coming up. And every time we think we've passed one, there's another one on the way. We always have opportunities to grow, to progress and to advance in the things of God. Ecclesiastes 12, verse, uh, 9 to 12. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set out in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails, given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Everyone got their photos? And the next one is life is a responsibility. Succeed in it. That's Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, which says, in essence, life is a gift from the hand of God. And like any gift, there is an obligation associated with it. There's an obligation to value it, to cherish it, and to gratefully use it. We need to fear God with a godly fear, an attitude of gratitude, reverence, and awe. It is an attitude of love and respect for the power and the greatness of the giver of the gift. You may feel that you've been heading in the wrong direction. Well, this is the time, this is for the moment to get yourself back into the game of life. Begin to see it as a school in which you grow. Begin to see it as a responsibility in which you succeed. For just as the old hymn reminds us, life is worth the living simply because Christ lives. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he or she has done, whether good or bad. That is not judgment of sin. Our sin is judged in Christ. We are judged in that sense already. The judgment seat of Christ is to judge the works that we have done in Christ's name and for him and for his glory and the glory of the Father. It's not only the amount of work but it's the quality of the work that was done and the motive that was behind it. And I think sometimes when we hear that, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these wonderful things in your name? And Jesus said, no, depart, I never knew you. Why? 
perhaps the motive was wrong. The motive was self-aggrandizement. The motive was self-centered. You know, people can preach Christ from a selfish motive And then you get the others, and Michael Yusuf mentioned this this morning. He called it hyper grace. I grew to know it from Kenneth Connor as greasy grace. Do what you like because God's grace covers it all. No. That's a wrong view of God's grace. God's grace does cover many things, but it doesn't cover you deliberately going out and doing sinful things and expecting God, oh, she'll be right, thank you, Lord. That's the sportsman image. Do what you like and God will forgive you. No. Doesn't work like that. Hyper grace, greasy grace. They go from one hype to the next. It's to get people excited, to keep people excited. Because if they're excited and all the rest of it, then they give into the ministry. And who benefits from that? Usually the minister in the churches that preach like that. Where Christ is lifted high to the glory of God the Father, that's the place to be. Not where somebody is necessarily hyping people up and hyping things up. I don't know why I got onto that, but I think maybe we just needed to hear it. In fact, I haven't mentioned this to Alan and Richard yet, but when we walk in here, let us exalt his name together. Jen and I were talking one day and we thought, how about when we go out? the place either under the exit sign or somewhere there or perhaps on the above the window on the uh, mother's room out there. The Micah 6.8 He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God and that's a good thing to remember do justly love mercy walk humbly with your God do the works that God has prepared beforehand for you to do and you'll have nothing to fear from the judgment seat of Christ I wonder if we